book of Matthew today, we're going through the Sermon on the Mount and uh, as we do our study of the book of Matthew. And so today we are in Matthew chapter 5. We are continuing the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus had started out with the Beatitudes in the first 11 verses or you know, right around that. And um, in the Beatitudes, we found out what kingdom character was. And then we started to see how we're supposed to let our light shine. And then he said this thing that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you won't even enter into the kingdom of God. Now, that automatically takes us back to the first Beatitude. You know, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And Jesus was saying there that we have to have an understanding of our absolute need of his grace in order to get into the kingdom. Okay, the, the, the idea is that we need to recognize our spiritual poverty. We have nothing to offer him. We can't bribe him. We can't do him a favor. It's only because of his grace and because of what he's pouring out on us that we are in his church and that we are able to step into his kingdom. And so all of that is in play. But then he starts talking about the ways that the Pharisees messed up. And he starts saying things like, you have heard that it was said, but now I'm going to make the real application for this particular teaching because the Pharisees would mess it up. You have heard that it said, we studied this last week, don't murder. But I'm telling you, if you are angry with your brother or sister in your heart, you're already committing murder. You've already violated the law. And the Pharisees would not recognize that. They would say, they were the ones that cleaned the outside of the cup and dish. They'd say, well, I'm just going to make sure I don't murder, but I can hate as many people as I want. And that was, that was I mean, they were, they were in total violation of the law. So Jesus is trying to explain to people it's not just the outward actions. Our outward actions are important. I mean, it's, <laughs> if you hate someone, don't get into the outward action but then ask God to help you with the inner attitude. Okay. So Jesus is continuing that study with the you have heard that it was said thing and bringing up a couple of topics along the way to expose what the intent of the word of God was about not just our actions, but our attitudes. So today um, we are going to talk about exceeding the righteousness of the legalists in a couple of different areas. We have, he said, unless your righteousness su surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees. And the truth is, is we can't exceed their righteousness by our actions. We can exceed their righteousness by getting on our knees and saying, Lord, we, we need your help. And by the end of the day, we're all going to be saying that. So there you go. Okay. Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 to 37. Uh, it's my translation of the book of Matthew and the scriptures which are in front of us today, which means it's always good for you to have your own version that you love to study from open in front of you. Verse 27 and 28, Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who is looking at a woman with sexual desire for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Okay, well, that's pretty blunt. Everyone around Jesus is like, what? Okay, because the Pharisees just said, outward action, just prevent yourself from getting involved in the activity and you're fine but they could be lecherous in all their on the inside didn't really matter and so jesus again goes to the heart of the issue not the external actions now we need to do some definitions adultery was sexual relationship with a married woman who is not your wife. That's what Exodus 20:14 was talking about. When it talked about adultery, it was always talking about uh, having a relationship with a married woman. Whether the man was in married or unmarried didn't matter. Adultery required a married woman. And in that sense, there was a defrauding going on always, too, as the husband was being stolen from, if you will. So there was a whole lot more going on than just uh, basically sexual immorality. There was this thing about, um, you know, also defrauding a, a brother. So, but Jesus said, you've heard it, don't commit adultery. And then he goes back to the whole reason behind it rather than just talking about adultery. Um, in essence, he's saying if you're looking on an off-limits woman, that's off-limits, okay, with intent, that's 
going to be the issue that he's talking about. By the way, who's an off-limits woman? Well, anybody who's not your wife. Is that fair? Yeah. Anybody who's not your wife. Okay. And, and obviously the same thing for women too. But remember, we are t he's quoting from an era. The commandment comes from an era which they were really more interested or dealing with the men because the women didn't have the options in the way that the men did back in that culture. But obviously this is talking about off-limit people. Who are the off-limit people? Anyone who's not your husband, anyone who's not your wife. Okay, so Jesus is saying, I'm telling you that if you got that intent, that sexual desire for this off-limits person, well, you've already committed adultery. Now, what that means is that the entire population of the earth, at least the male population, is guilty. And especially in today's day and age, most of the female population. Because this is, God has put a strong sexual desire in us. And unfortunately, because of the fall into sin, that sexual desire has been turned away from just the direction it's supposed to be. And, it's, and we all understand, we're living in an age of absolute insanity with what's going on. Did you see the person that's in charge of the nuclear waste stockpile? If you did, I mean, I'm not going to talk about it real much here today. I'm just saying, just look it up. Just someone new appointed is into things that um, are bizarre. Oh, way more than that. Okay, way more than that. But yeah, he's, uh, it, whatever it is. Okay. It's, it's, I mean, so we are in a culture that is saturated with, you know, stuff in the past. It used to be called perversion. The Bible still does call it that. But okay. Um, so anyway, Jesus is saying, listen, it's about what's going on up here. It's not just what the Pharisees said. So if you want to deal, if you really want to get to the heart of the issue, above and beyond what the Pharisees would do, let's talk about what's going on in your mind. Let's talk about what's going on in your heart. Um, this, by the way, I, I loved this. I saw this in a particular Bible commentary, the New International Commentary on the New Testament. The focus is thus not, as some tender adolescent consciences have read it, on sexual attraction as such, but on the desire for and perhaps the planning of an illicit sexual liaison. A lot of times, you know, people that are developing in their sexuality, obviously they're going to have attractions to members of the opposite sex. That attraction is not sin. That attraction is part of how the Lord makes sure that we go out eventually and be fruitful and multiply. The only issue is if we take it beyond just an attraction to a fantasy. And so that's where you've got to take control of your mind. So I did love that way of phrasing it. James 1, 14 to 15 says, But each man is tested by his own desires when he is lured and hooked by them. That picture, lured and hooked by them. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is grown up, produces death. And you say, death? How does death happen? Well, I mean, think about it in the area of sexual immorality. If you have an affair with someone else's spouse, especially if you're a male, the husband may kill you. Okay? That, I mean, that's, that's, that's a danger. Okay? The other dangers are we live in an, an age of uh, some very deadly STDs or at least some things that can affect your life for the rest of your life. You know, it's death works. And so um, all of that comes into play when you're talking about releasing death into this area of your life because any sickness or disease is a part of death. And so there's a real warning here for this particular thing. If you want to make sure that you're not walking with death, and by the way, you know, obviously we live as New Covenant Christians. I'm going to talk more about this when we get into the next topic. But the, uh, um, there's, a, there's forgiveness, you understand? And then if you are walking in forgiveness, if you've picked up something in the past of an STD, you can pray for the Lord to heal that. That's not a lifelong curse. That's the Lord saying, okay, I can, you know, and, and pray persistently with faith. Approach the throne of grace, grace with confidence. We all have stuff in our past we're ashamed of. It's just the way it is. If you're saved out of uh, uh, unbelief, and even if you aren't saved out of unbelief, but grew up in a Christian household, we all, as we grow up, step into stuff that's just stupid. And the Lord convicts us of us, and, you know, and then we, you know, we walk in the forgiveness of it. So it's one of the problems with Twitter and 
Facebook and all the social media because as a teenager, you do stupid things publicly now. <laughs> and they will never forget. Okay. I had a, uh, I watched a message last week that Tom Hardiman did, and he was admitting what his 17 year old self had done, especially when he was talking about being behind the wheel of a car. And it was a really nice message, and I just texted him the, mes- the response saying, what this 17-year-old has done will stay totally quiet. <laughs> when I was 17, we don't want to know about it. Um, he laughed. He said, well, that was the G-rated version. I went, okay. All right, all right. <laughs> okay, anyway, so looking on an off-limits woman with intent is certainly part of you know, the, the, the focus or other unwed liaisons. Um, uh, other unwed liaisons are fornication, the pornaya thing, the, the sexual morality. And uh, so there's, you know, it, it's, of course, the adultery is an issue as he's talking about that, but then all of the other unwed liaisons are certainly in here also. And so we need to try to walk according to God's pattern. When we have sexual desire for someone, we should be looking to see if we can get married to that person, if they're Christians. So, um, Jesus is simply saying that you can commit adultery apart from your actions just by living in it. And that is very interesting. Okay. And then the Pharisees were like, you know, they could live in fantasy land all they wanted, and they were, you know, oh, I'm, I've never acted out on it, so I'm as righteous as you come. And they were hypocrites. They did a bunch. Next verse, going on, Jesus calls for drastic response to this thought life. He said, so if your right eye causes you to stumble, remove it and throw it from you, for it is better for you that you lose one of the parts of your body and not have your whole body thrown into Gehenna. Gehenna is just the word for hell that he uses. Many of your translations will actually write the word hell. I just like to use the word Jesus used, Gehenna. It's, it, was the, it was the garbage dump outside Jerusalem in a valley. It stunk. It was miserable. If you had to go in there, you got out as quick as you could. And so it was a perfect picture of hell. <laughs> it was a stinky, nasty, decaying, rotting place to be. And so that's why the, not just Jesus, but the whole culture called that a perfect example of what hell is like. So anyway... The, uh, the right eye is the dominant eye in two-thirds of the people. And you say, how do you figure that out? Look it up on the Internet. <laughs> the right eye is the dominant eye in two-thirds of the people, which is why he can then say the right eye, which is your dominant eye. Any eye losing vision in it would not be great. However, in your dominant eye, it would be... So he's simply saying... If your dominant eye causes you issues, uh, it'd be okay if you, um, if it leads you to stumble. He's simply saying, hey, it's better for you to lose one of the parts of your body. Remove it and throw it from you. By the way, there's something called hyperbole. He's not, uh, you do understand if you pull out one of your eyes, you're not going to get rid of lust. You do understand this. So did he. And so he, this is just him saying, take drastic action. And everyone was around him was going, get rid of an eye? And, and of course, that's not the point. He doesn't want you to get rid of an eye. He wants you to take drastic action if this is something that's causing you to stumble. And that's drastic action. Now, we live in a world that is, as I said already, filled with awful stuff. Our computers, our devices have easy access. Not just easy access, they're used as fishing expeditions by pornographers to try to hook people and lure them into sin. And so, you know, if this is an area that you stumble you know, throw out your computer. Be a Luddite. It's better to be someone who doesn't like technology. It's better to be a Luddite than it is to be someone who is stumbling and headed for torment. Now, by the way, 
Jesus is talking about someone who eventually demonstrates that they, they, they aren't a believer because they have absolutely no control over themselves. And the Holy Spirit does give us control, although it's a battle as we go for, we cooperate with the Holy Spirit, we fight against stuff. But so when he says you're in danger of the fire of hell, having your body thrown in, that's going to happen to unbelievers. But there is certainly torment released to believers by the enemy of our souls when we fall into this thing. And so torment goes. When a Christian is, is falling into sin, torment, you know, David said it. He said, I groaned on my bed for the nine months that he was apart from God after he uh, had committed sin with Bathsheba and then killed her husband. And so Jesus is saying, take drastic action. Okay. Um, by the way, for Christians... You know, it, it may not be feasible uh, to throw out your technology because of work or et cetera. I'm just going to leave this up on the slides for a couple of screens. Uh, CovenantEyes.com teaches you how to take control of your devices so that the enemy can't use them as a lure to you. And CleanBrowsing.org also something which is good uh, because they both teach you how you can use your devices without having that hook constantly being thrown at you um, important so okay the uh, you need to avoid a negative outcome in your life that's what Jesus is talking about he goes on in the same vein and if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you, for it is better for you that you lose one, part, one of the parts of your body and not have your whole body pass into Gehenna. Same thing, except now he focuses on the right hand, which is the dominant hand in 90% of the people. Now, again, he's not telling you to cut off your right hand. He's saying take drastic action. By the way, in the uh, Old Testament, the word hand could be used to be speaking of the male sexual organ. Origen, who was one of the early church fathers, took it literally and castrated himself to get rid of lust. And to his horror, he found out it didn't stop lust. Because it's, it's not about body parts, it's about what's going on on the inside. He, it's very nice that he did that for the rest of us so we could... I would have just gone and found a eunuch, a eunuch somewhere, you know, the... Because they were all over the courts of kings at that time. So you could say, hey, let's talk about this. But no, he, he went. So anyway, he says, if it causes you to stumble, take drastic action. Again, that is hyperbole. Um, you know, as, as, mature, as we mature as Christians, the Holy Spirit should be able to help us so that uh, when there's something going by, it may grab our attention, but we can turn away from it. Yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's where we need to get as Christians. And I don't know if we'll ever in this flesh get to the point where it won't first, because you know, it's an unguarded thing, where all of a sudden we're looking, oh, I ain't looking over there. Okay. Um, but I do know that the Holy Spirit, as he works in us, can bring us to a place where this is not something that can hook us anymore. Now, that doesn't mean you treat it carelessly. I still won't watch a movie without checking out Family Film Review. I just won't. I, why? Why would I want to step into something that surprises me? So I, I look up family. I just put in the words family film review, and then I'll put in the name of the movie, and you'll find multiple sites that will tell e you everything, every objectionable thing. You can put in Christian family film review. That way you'll find out even from a Christian perspective the, the uh, spiritual message of the movie, you know, whatever. And, but that's just, that's just how I'm going to live because I don't want to test the Lord my God. I want to make sure that I'm living with wisdom. So the same, same thing is going on. To avoid a negative outcome, take drastic action. Okay, so he's talking about this thought life thing with regarding sexual desire and lust. And then he goes in, and this is like he's going in for the, he's, he's, he's amping this up, aiming at the Pharisees. And I, you'll see why in a minute. But he goes after marriage and divorce. It has been said, verses 31 to 32, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for reason of sexual morality, forces her into adultery, and whoever marries a woman who has been divorced commits adultery. So 
Jesus, again, is talking about things in which the Pharisees were involved, and he is going for the heart of the matter rather than what they thought they were doing or what they thought they could do right. Uh, The Pharisees on divorce, not so good. They looked at Deuteronomy 24.1, and Jesus is really, we're going to talk about this much more in Matthew 19, so I'm just brushing by it today but Matthew chapter 24 verse or Deuteronomy chapter 24 verse 1 says this when a man takes a wife and marries her and it occurs that and if it occurs that she does not find favor in his eyes because he finds some indecency in her and he gives her a certificate of divorce puts it in her hand and sends her from his house that's verse 1 And then it goes on if she remarries another man and then she divorces that guy or he dies. When she's free again, the first guy can't remarry her. That's that's the whole point of the scripture. And Jesus brings that out very clearly in Matthew chapter 19. The Pharisees say, you know, Moses commanded us to divorce our wives. There's no command in here. The command is don't remarry her after you've divorced her. But they wanted to use this scripture to say God commands us to divorce our wives when we find anything indecent in her. Pharisees were divorcing all of the time. And yet they said, we were keeping the commands perfectly. We are not a problem people. And they were more than a problem people. The key issue for them was this word indecency that I've got circled right there. Um, That word could mean a bunch of different things. It could mean an uncleanness. Um, it could mean you know, just anything that they found displeasing. The uh, school of Shammai, there were two basic theological schools in Israel. The school of Shammai said that it had to be adultery. This was the uncleanness. The uh, school of Hillel said it could be anything, including that she burned your supper. Which one do you think the Pharisees liked the best? School of Hillel. Okay, so they... They were uh, involved in things. The Pharisees had very lax divorce practices, and so they were multiplying adultery all over the place. Now, there's a very famous movie that has a scene in it discussing the uh, theology of the school of Hillel. And that very famous movie is Fiddler on the Roof. Now, I did get a copy of the movie, and I tried to record the scene. And, of course, all of the um, protections that are now involved in movies made it impossible. So I did it the way everyone does it. I just took my iPhone and videoed it. Even though she only burned this cooking, he is permitted to divorce her. Just for supper? I'm sorry. Okay, so that... In Fiddler on the Roof, there's this throwaway scene. This is, as this guy comes in, he's bringing in the bad news. And then the next one is the new arrival. And if you remember Fiddler on, Fiddler on the Roof, the new arrival was not a baby. Anyway, so I won't, I won't reveal the spoiler if you've never seen it. But... Um, so he's, they're talking about Hillel, the school of Hillel. Of all the things that they could have the rabbi debating with his people, they're talking about that particular theology, about the fact that Hillel taught that if your wife burned your supper, you could divorce her, just give her a certificate of divorce. It was easy. You just gave him a certificate of divorce in front of witnesses and said, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. Done. So they're li- lax marriage. Now, by the way, remember where women were at in that age? They, they would suddenly be destitute. This was so bad in the book of Malachi that God says, I, I hate it when a man covers himself with violence toward the wife of his youth. And he was talking about divorce because they suddenly were destitute. You know, the women got a little bit older. The new model came along. Okay, bye-bye. And now wh- how is she going to make a living? How is she going to live? How is she going to survive? That's violence, and that's why in Malachi I talked about that. So the uh, lax divorce practices, Jesus is saying it just multiplies adultery all over the place in the strictest sense of what adultery meant, right? Remember what adultery meant, married a woman who was married to another man. And if you broke this covenant, there's still a real sense that it's in effect because you can't just divorce someone because they burnt your dinner. 
So now you've got this, this situation where the woman who has to remarry is um, stuck in this situation. And there's, be, be aware, of course, that the Lord is not holding her accountable for the adultery. He's holding the husband accountable for the adultery, but he's saying to the husband, you're, making, you're forcing her into an adulterous situation, and then anyone that marries her, is, you're, just, you're just multiplying what the, the, the term, you know, what the, uh, adultery is in uh, everywhere. And so he's like, don't do this. You guys are, you guys are just, okay. Now, we live in a time of fairly lax divorce. Um, as when I speak about abortion issues, I realize that even in a congregation this size, there's going to be people that had abortions. We live in a, wor- a fallen world, you know, before he came to Christ. We have people who, even as Christians, could be divorced just because of the fact that it's everywhere. And so remember, we do live in the New Covenant. Okay, there's something called forgiveness. And here's the thing. You know, in the Old Covenant, when someone did something really bad, they took a sacrifice, like a ram. Never a predator, a ram. (laughs) And they... (laughs) And they made that sacrifice. And they walked away and they were absolutely forgiven. That was under the old covenant. We've got a much better sacrifice. Okay. We've got we've got the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So when we talk about new covenant forgiveness, if they could walk away from the sacrifice of an animal, forgiven. How much more can we walk away from the Stuff that we get involved in, forgiveness, forgiven. Okay, so next verse. Again, you have heard that it was said to the ancients, do not commit perjury, but fulfill your oath sworn to the Lord. But I am telling you not to swear at all. Here's another one the Pharisees were great at. They could, they could lie to you your face just by how they did the oaths. And Jesus, because they could, they could literally swear on something that had no validity in their opinion. You're going, oh, yeah, you just swore on something, you know? And then, you know, do you double pinky promise? <laughs> oh, I had my fingers crossed, lying to their face. That was the Pharisees. So Jesus is going after them, not as bad as he did in Matthew 23. In Matthew 23, he guts the Pharisees and the Sadducees, which is, they, you know, there's a reason they wanted to kill him. He just points out how wicked they were and at that particular point. This is what he says to the Pharisees and Sadducees. How will you escape being condemned to hell? These are the most, and and the people, these are the most spiritual people around, the most good-looking spiritual people around. And Jesus looks at them in front of the crowds, and the crowds were delighted by this because Jesus was exposing them all the time. He did a better job than the truckers in Canada. So the whole idea of taking a false oath is there. Oaths had become a means to deceive. That pure and simple, that's what they did. And so Jesus is saying, hey, avoid the whole issue of trying to deceive people with your words by simply not swearing anymore. By the way, um, the common understanding of this, which I agree with, is that he's talking about in your normal speech. If you are required to take an oath, the Anabaptists, some Baptists, you know, more legalistic Baptist denominations, and the, the Jehovah's Witnesses say that you can't take an, a, a swear in court or for your driver's license or you know, whatever those things are. Um, when your government requires you to say, yes, I swear that I am telling the truth, that is something they're requiring and we with good... Co- conscience can enter into that he's talking about that way that we try to pervert the truth and so he says don't swear at all and then he he talks about the things that the pharisees would swear by neither by heaven for it's the throne of god nor by the earth for it's a footstool for his feet nor to jerusalem for it's the city of the great king nor should you swear by your head for you are not able to make one hair white or black that was before hair dye and even then, it's not you doing it. I would like my hair to be right. Okay. So, I think your kids maybe can make your hair white. But. <laughs> yeah. 
Heaven, he says, don't swear by heaven. It's God's throne. That's God's place. Why would you swear by heaven? What does that have to do with you? And he says, don't swear by earth, for it's God's footstool. That's pretty picturesque, isn't it? God's enthroned in heaven. He's got his feet out. And if you think about it in the picture of the sea of glass, he's in front of the sea of glass, and he's looking out over the earth. It is kind of like where his feet would be. (laughs) That would almost be his footstool. But he's saying this is the place that he rules, his footstool. So if the earth is ruled by God, how can you swear by it? Because what do you have to do with it? You know, doesn't make any sense. He says, nor to Jerusalem, and it really does say to Jerusalem. It's not by Jerusalem. It's to Jerusalem, because that's what they would say. Your translations may say by Jerusalem. It's not what the Greek says. It says to Jerusalem. It changes very specifically, because people would say, you know, if I'm facing Jerusalem when I take a vow, I've got to tell the truth. I think if you're facing away from Jerusalem, you should be telling the truth. And then if you swear by your head, you can't even, like you said, you can't even change the color of a hair on your head. What are you going to do? All these things are silly, and yet they were part of the elaborate formulas that they used to deceive one another. And Jesus is very clear. Let your speech be yes, yes, no, no. Anything beyond these is from the evil one. Well, that's pretty fun, Jesus. Stick with simple speech. Yes or no. By the way, it really just says yes, yes, no, no. And some translations say let your yes be yes, your no be no. It could be. That that certainly is, is legitimate. James seems to take it that way in James chapter 5, verse 12. Above everything, my brothers, do not continue to swear, neither by heaven nor by earth or any other oath. Let your yes be yes and your no, no, in order that you do not fall under judgment. So James is basically repeating this part of the Sermon on the Mount, and simply saying, let your yes be yes and your no be no. So that's what Jesus is talking about. Don't, just, just when you're talking to people, let, be a person of integrity with your speech. And everything will be fine then. Just make sure that you're a person of your word. And if you're a person of your word, you're going to be in good shape. It was, it, I mean, not the house we're living in now, because we have full contracts on everything. But the, the house that we lived in for a season of time, we lived three years before we bought it. You know, and many of you know what it was. It had acreage with it and everything. Um, after our first six-month rental, there was no contracts after that. It was an agreement verbally between me and the landlord. And for three years, we kept that those agreements were the way they were. And you'd say, well, you're the one at disadvantage there. I knew he was a man of his word. I wasn't even worried. It never even, it never even entered my mind that he'd back out on his word, and he never did. And finally, at the end of the three years, he came and said, hey, I want to bless your congregation with this. You have to buy it, but, you know, we'll make sure that we set it up so that you can afford it. And because he was a man of his word. And of course, those, we had the contracts and everything, because now we're talking about, you know, turning the property over to our name. But I love that type of relationship. We were so comfortable. I, I, I don't think he was a Christian might have been might have grew up one you know i don't know all i know is that uh, i trusted him and i trusted him because you could sense the integrity on him so and he says if you just stick with yes yes no no you leave no room for the evil one to manipulate the situation who's the evil one say that it's interesting when jesus speaks he points out the evil one in many different contexts because he wants us to be aware of the fact that we have a personal enemy and that personal enemy may not know us by name but he certainly has minions who know us by name and we need to recognize that they're working against our interests and God's interest in our lives always and the good news is that we are protected and we can trust in that protection When Peter says, watch out, your enemy, the devil, is prowling prowling around like a roaring lion, from that message, um, that picture, he's a lion on a leash. You know, if you ever walk up to a a dog house where it has a, a really mean guard dog, and you're walking up to that dog house, and the dog is wearing a chain, and he can come rushing up to you, and as long as it's a good chain, he can't get to you. You can stare at it if you know about the chain. Everything's good, right? 
Because you know, he's not going he's going to hit the end of that chain and that's going to be it. That's the way it is. Say all of a sudden you just go like this. He's got your leg. And he can maul it all he wants because you've just stepped into his territory. And that's the picture for Christians. Don't step into the evil one's territory. Don't make yourself a target that he can get to. You can make, you can give him legal permission to come after you. It's one of the reasons we're always praying for mercy in case we do stupid things. Because you're cutting off that thing so that he can't come back after you for it. But don't, don't step into his arena. Don't, don't become someone who follows his ethics because following his ethics, step, you step into his arena. And when you're stepping into his arena, he's very good. He's had thousands of years of history to be able to get really good at taking a bite out of you without even you knowing you were bit until a critical moment. And suddenly it comes back and gets you. So Jesus was teaching us to, to live above, to exceed the Pharisees in our ability to live righteously. And he does it by just saying, look at what's going on in the heart. And what that does for us is it makes us realize, my goodness, I need to repent and step into that forgiveness. Because that's how we live above the Pharisees. Recognize our need. Again, back to the beginning of the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Because they recognize their great need. And Jesus provided for our great need on the cross. And we ask him for forgiveness. If you don't know him, just ask him to be your Lord and Savior. It comes as a package, by the way. We can't just ask him for Savior. You can try, but if he does come and take residence, he's going to demonstrate very quickly he's also your Lord. And Lord means absolute sovereign. So you can't say, Jesus, I want your forgiveness. I just don't want your rules. It doesn't work that way. Jesus is Lord and Savior. And then when, he, you know, when we ask him into our lives to forgive us and to be our Lord, what happens is he sends the Holy Spirit into our hearts. And the Holy Spirit then starts to remodel us. And sometimes remodeling is a pain. You ever remodel your house? Then you have to tear some things down in order to build things up. And so there's, after we come to Christ, it can be a time of remodeling in our emotions and in our will and it just everything starts getting shifted around it may take years to get it absolutely right well a lifetime but <laughs> but after the first few years you should get into a place where you're able to kind of navigate pretty well but to begin with the lord's going to want to deal with things and here's by the way if you're first coming to christ um you will the lord will only give you what you can bear which means some desires he's just going to take away some of those negative desires that can hurt you, he'll just take away and you'll say, my goodness, that'll be your testimony. The Lord just took this desire away. Generally speaking, he doesn't just want to take away desires in you. He wants you to overcome those desires, but he's only going to have them come back to you when he knows you're mature enough to handle them. That's why sometimes people think, you know, oh man, I got saved and I no longer had a desire for any, name the addictive substance. And then they're walking down the line a couple of years, and all of a sudden the desire for the addicting substance comes back, and they go, oh my goodness, am I backslidden? No, the Lord thinks you're strong enough to now work on this yourself and overcome it. So that you now, it, there's no foothold in you. You can, hand, you can walk on your own as a mature Christian rather than being someone who God's got to keep his hand on like this to stop, make sure the temptation blocks you. He wants us to get to the point where when the temptation comes, it just bounces off. So that, that's our maturing process. I mean, and that's why sometimes you run into something about yourself that you thought was long gone, and the Lord's just saying, just bring it back so you understand where you're at. And, you, you know, you can say, okay, good, I'm going to, okay, I'm going to get better at this. So, okay, let's pray. Lord, thank you for the opportunity today to look at these very penetrating scriptures, which will... You know, they, they cut to the dividing of the soul and spirit. And I ask that you would help us live in victory above and beyond anything the Pharisees were able to live in. I ask that you help us live victorious in our lives always so that we might be shining lights in our culture and wherever we live. And Lord, I pray if there's anyone in this room that doesn't, hasn't come into a relationship with you, I, Lord, touch their hearts now. 
And by the way, if that describes you, the way that you enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ is just by saying, Lord, I want a relationship with you. I receive you as my Savior and my King. You died to forgive my sins. You rose again to announce that you're my King. That's all it takes. And if you do that, we have some people around here who would love to talk to you about growing in the Lord. And uh, Joel's one, Ron's one. Most of them were up here. I picked the ones who are, you know, have been up here at some point. Dawn's one. I could probably do it too. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful opportunity. Amen. Thank you. And anything before I say goodbye to the streamers? Is this working? Oh, yeah. Um, Bob Jones used to c uh, call it living above the snake, li snake line. So we need to live, if you think of that, there's a line, we need to live above the snake line, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Wow. So anyway. Bob Jones was our prophetic mentor who passed away in 2014. He was basically a Missouri farmer. Wonderful man. Okay, streamers. Thanks for being with us today. We'll be back on Friday night at 7.30, next Sunday at 10 a.m. God bless. Oh, and if you live in the Coral Springs area or Parkland area, come on up to the memorial tomorrow night. Uh, pretty important time for the community to come together on the fourth anniversary of the tragedy at Stoneman Douglas.